Hey, uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the 24 hour of PASS uh, on the evolution of data platform. We are excited to have you here, and uh, today Bill Jacobs uh, is going to present on advanced our analytics in 2016 using our tools in Visual Studio. This is a 24 hour of PASS, uh, consists of 24 live webcasts delivered by expert speakers from the PASS community. As you know, PASS community is basically like a lot of people who share and learn on SQL Server and, uh, you know, interest in SQL Server. The sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. To access uh, any on-demand sessions, please visit www.24hoursofpass.com for all session links. My name is Damu Venkatesan and I also head the healthcare virtual chapter for uh, PASS uh, virtual chapter and um, I'm part of the Atlanta BA uh, community and uh, help out here in the Atlanta MDF, another PASS chapter here and also the BA chapter. I have a few introductory slides uh, before I hand over the reins to Bill. Next slide please. If you require any technical assistance, please type your questions in the question panel on the right and uh, we, we will uh, get an assistance uh, as soon as possible. And if you have any issues with um, uh, hearing uh, or you know seeing the slides, let us know quickly and we'll try to uh, get through that. Feel free to enter your questions anytime and once you have uh, all the questions and we will get to the Q&A portion at the end of the session and Bill will you know, answer most of it, and if, if we run over the time, then we will uh, get get it answered and post it on a blog. You'll be able to uh, zoom in on the presentation content by using the zoom button located on the bottom of the presentation window. Uh, please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session, so your feedback is important to us uh, to make sure that we do our job right and um, any suggestions will be taken seriously to uh, next time so that we can implement them. And it will appear on in your web browser at the end of the session. Next slide, please. I would like to thank uh, uh, our presenting sponsors, Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, Hardenworks, and Redgate. In addition to that, I would like to thank our supporting sponsors for this event, Heavily Packet Enterprise, SQL Century, and SanDisk. The staging of 24-hour pass would not be possible without these uh, uh, their generous support and they are the reason this event is available for free of charge for us. Next slide, please. Make sure you explore everything else PASS has uh, to offer for data professionals. You can join the local user groups around the world and special interest groups and find free online resources through our learning center and read uh, read up on the latest community news in the connector newsletter. Make sure that you sign up for the newsletter so that you get the latest uh, information from PASS. Next slide, please. Now uh, it's about the, our speaker today, uh, Bill Jacobs. Uh, he uh, is a, a product marketing specialist at uh, Revolution Analytics and he, head, he heads the engineering uh, for uh, Revolution Analytics part of it, which is now part of uh, Microsoft, and uh, he, uh, basically they bring a lot of power to the R and to Hadoop and large enterprise data warehouse uh, situations uh, over the last two years. Previously, uh, Bill was a director of product marketing at Pivotal, uh, where he helped launch Pivotal Hadoop and uh, held similar roles at other companies like NetEase, Sybase, Apple, and HP. Next slide, please. If you have any questions, uh, um, you know, put it in the question panel and uh, and now I give uh, the reins to Bill and Bill, please take over. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, to make sure everyone is clear, uh, I didn't put it on this slide. The uh, bio is actually kind of a historic bio uh, with the acquisition of Revolution Analytics about a year ago. Uh, I became a director in the technical product marketing group at Microsoft, focused on our R-based products. 
So I'm responsible not only for our uh, product marketing and technical marketing for uh, the our services components of SQL Server, but more broadly for uh, the Microsoft R Server in a number of other instances, um, some of them very directly uh, supportive of our sponsors of today's webcast, particularly Hortonworks, but also Cloudera, uh, MapR, and uh, uh, on another database, uh, Teradata. So we have a very broad product offering that we're building here at Microsoft. Today we're going to talk about um, an implementation of the Microsoft R Server that is shipped with SQL Server called the SQL Server R Services. Um, I'd like to do some background setting first, and I'll spend about 20 minutes spinning through these slides fairly quickly. For any of you uh, who have not been um, uh, directly briefed or aware of what we're doing uh, with, uh, with the R language and with the uh, SQL R services capabilities, but then I'll leap into a little bit of a discussion of some changes we've made to Visual Studio to make it a good IDE for the R language and to uh, provide it as a tool that data scientists can use when they're working with their SQL Server administrators and programmers and application developers uh, to combine their efforts to create a whole new crop of applications that have predictive capabilities. The first question is why do we do this? You know, and, and, and I've got a million slides on how big the possibilities of the data, uh, collected data of the world is in the future, but the most interesting number we came up with, we, we, we chartered IDC to go out and study what's the impact on businesses of of taking data from simply being an exhaust byproduct of the organization and turning it into a basis for making predictions. And they came up with this rather large number of $1.6 trillion. And this was the difference in revenue earned and impact on the businesses between those organizations that embrace predictive analytics based on the data and those that don't. So it's a pretty big number, and the whole study is available uh, on the Microsoft website. You can go read it. But, but the key thing is it's really a big number. I don't know that it's right, but if it's even off by half an order of magnitude, it's still a very appreciable reason to be uh, looking at predictive analytics in SQL Server and others. We see it in every industry. Um, uh, as, I, as, as my bio indicated, I worked in a number of companies where we were building essentially exotic data warehouse technology that could provide a basis for predictive analytics. What's happening now is predictive analytics has gone full on mainstream. And people not only want to stand up separate data warehouses or analytic data stores, but they now want, uh, they need the ability to bring that predictive capability directly into the analytics lifecycle. And that means parking your analytics out in some distant far-flung system hidden in the closet in marketing is really no longer a good way to handle it. So as we look out across these industries, we're seeing predictive analytics the use of languages like R and Python and, and Azure Machine Learning uh, across these becoming a, a core piece of the application development lifecycle. More on that later. So when we looked across the $1.6 trillion uh, that, that IDC says uh, will separate the adopters from the non-adopters, there are really four areas uh, that, that they're, uh, where they're harnessing that data and predictive analytics to affect the business. Certainly building better products is a good one. Um, I'll give you some examples of each of these very quickly. Um, there was an auto company, and this was, this was in a prior life, um, a very leading edge uh, as cars became telematic in that they collected and presented data back to the manufacturer or to insurance companies, et cetera, lots of interesting things were found. And a particular Korean car company stopped by and said, well, we've got three cars on the road right now that, uh, that produce telematics. And we weren't watching it closely enough because we had a massive part failure and we wound up having customers' cars sitting on the dealer lot for two weeks in the worst cases because we ran out of parts. And he said if we'd been looking at the data and predicting failure rates by watching the early part of the failure curve, he said we'd have known to order a lot of parts from that vendor and get them distributed through the supply chain. So that's a, that's a case of negative business impact. Um, a positive side of that impact is a case that we've seen here in Microsoft, and that is decent crop elevators who have uh, made massive improvements in the cost of maintaining elevators by actually having the elevators report back how many trips up and down they're making and what kind of condition the various moving parts in that elevator are. Um, the old, one of the oldest businesses in analytics is engaging customers. 
we've seen lots and lots of stories here about uh, uh, retailers and the, you know, the, the, the shining stars of the industry have been companies like Walmart who have used analytics to predict when to put umbrellas on the end cap near the front door. That's a, a hyper simple example. But now retailers are onto very sophisticated analytics like can I gather store performance, competitive store performance, demographics, housing price data, retail expenditure data, year-over-year -year store performance, all into one clump of data, massive clump of data, a couple that I know that do this are in the multi-petabyte range, and then from that predict which corner should we buy the lot and put up a store. Simple question, massive impact on the business for those retailers that can better predict the best places to put new stores. Optimizing operations is a fairly obvious one, but it varies very much by industry. There's an entire floor in Houston, Texas of people who do nothing but monitor pumps. Why do they do that? Well, there are lots and lots of pumps on an oil drilling rig, and if the right pumps fail, the productivity of that oil rig goes to dead zero, and that puts a very high value on monitoring, measuring, and performing prescriptive maintenance. When should I maintain that pump? When should I schedule to take it out of production? Um, when is that pump starting to give me uh, a signature of vibration or noise or poor performance that tells me it's about to fail? Because failures are way more expensive than pulling things out just ahead of failure. And finally, empowering employees. There, there are a, a vast number of applications here that we're seeing them every day in Office 365. A lot of what clutter does to your email, and I don't always like the choices clutter makes in my email, and sometimes I want to clobber clutter, but most of the time I like what it's doing by utilizing machine learning to determine which of my emails I don't need to see. So there's, there are applications across the business, and the numbers, interestingly enough, uh, from that $1.6 trillion study actually showed some interesting, I had thought that engaging customers and CRM applications would have been the biggest, and it turns out Optimizing the operations of the business and empowering employees are huge potential uh, uses of analytics. Now, we have adopted the R language at Revolution Analytics and worked with it for many years and then uh, um, uh, engineered to merge with Microsoft so that we could uh, take the benefits of the R language to much broader audiences. There's a couple of things you need to know about R. I'm going to guess that a lot of you have more of a database heritage than an analytics heritage. So the very basics are that R has shot up in popularity. It was the number nine language in 2014 in terms of use. And the first five languages on that list were general purpose languages like Java and C. This last year in 2015, uh, the, this uh, survey on the left has been repeated by the IEEE, and R went from number nine to number six, only behind general, purposes lang general purpose languages. So it is the highest ranking uh, purpose-specific software language in the world. Why is that? Well, the question is, who uses it? The answer is millions upon millions, particularly of life scientists, economists, bio, uh, biostatisticians, regular statisticians, uh, actuaries, risk analytics professionals, not people that you typically think of as being programmers. And that's where it's kind of snuck up on the rest of the IT world. And the result of its popularity is uh, there are uh, several large archives where those communities of users are sharing massive amounts of pre-built, uh, you know, community-validated, uh, vetted and validated uh, software packages like algorithms, techniques, connectors to gene sequencing machines, uh, lots and lots of very domain-specific stuff and lots and lots of generic statistics stuff. Right now, the CRAN archive, or the Comprehensive R Archive Network, is the dominant sharing location, freely open on the internet and mirrored about 10 or 20 places, and it has about 7,000 packages, and at least one of those packages, I counted 800 algorithms in it. So you get the idea that there are 10, 20, 30, 40,000 freely available packages and solutions and training courses available for our users. So there's this booming and burgeoning community of our users out there. And the question is, how do we embrace them and why embrace them? Separately, in, in the past, they could work separately. They, you know, the problems they were solving were desktop computer-sized problems. But the explosion of data that's available for analytics and the value that can be achieved from learning to analyze that data has forced the 
control of and responsibility for the facilities used in data analytics back into IT. Huge growth in databases in the late 2000s, the growth of platforms like APS, but also the competitive platforms, ones I worked on, like the Natiza platforms and the, and the Greenplum platforms. Those grew because the data got too big for the average desktop system. Now we're in a position where we're seeing things like Hadoop in the cloud and uh, databases in the cloud uh, providing uh, ever lower cost and larger platforms for managing massive amounts of data. So keep in mind as we go through this, if you're not are familiar, that it, it's interesting that it's a language, right? It, it, it's kind of an old language and it's kind of simplified. I, I like to think of it as visual basic for stats. It's easy enough someone like me can use it. But it has a huge community of users and thousands upon thousands of available packages for free. But reality is, you know, I, I like to say reality bites. I didn't invent the phrase, but it does. And it, it, it bites in a couple of ways. The open source R language doesn't scale very well. Many of the algorithms that are freely available are the results of university projects and other research and maybe haven't been tuned as far as they could. A lot of them are actually written in R and some are even written in Fortran. Uh, so there are some opportunities for improving the performance of the algorithms. It is an open source language and therefore does not enjoy commercial support. There's very good community support. But for some organizations, and you guys know who you are, you have governance folks who say, thou shalt not deploy open source software if you can't buy a support contract and essentially have what we uh, euphemistically call the one neck to choke. And finally, open source R because of some of the limitations in its scale, can be fairly testy to deploy. And we're going to show you today an example application where uh, we actually show you an easy way to deploy R. Once you've built something that makes a prediction, that's not a solution. That's not a solution until you bury it inside of an application or a reporting tool, and it actually causes that tool to behave differently. So we need to make that easier. That's kind of our four big challenges with R. The way I look at it is this. In the history of, of, of data science, the data scientists kind of lived separately. And I oftentimes go into rooms and I ask people in IT, do you know who your data scientists are? And the answer is generally a shrug. And I sometimes go in with groups of modelers and data scientists and risk analytics professionals. And other than one or two names, they can't point out who in IT they ought to be working with. And so one of the biggest problems we face is how do we bring this team together? How do we provide tools, capabilities, techniques and best practices that allow data engineers and uh, DBAs and, and uh, report developers and BI developers and most importantly the guy in the upper right there who's got kind of a strange look on his face like how much of a budget are you going to need to do this? How do we get all those people in agreement and working together as a team? That's the big challenge. If we win that, we win big. And so what has to happen is those those five or six audiences have to get together in a process that looks something like this. It will vary by organization but generally Building advanced analytics and using it to do anything meaningful is a three-step process. First, we have to decide what data we have that we can ingest and clean up and, and uh, uh, normalize, and, and then we have to study that data to find out which parts of that data are helping us predict something and which are just noise. And then we have to do the hardcore parts of, engineer, of the uh, data science and engineering, which uh, involves generally trying three or four different types of predictors, different types of learning systems whether it's logistic regression or linear regression or decision trees or random forests uh, or stochastic gradient descents, things that, you know, which of these types of techniques that are well known to statisticians produce the best, fastest running and most stable predictions. And then we have to find ways to take those predictions or models as we call them, and in some cases we'll, those models will show up as visualizations, and I'll show you some of those. But generally we take those models and find a way to then make them accessible. Historically, data science stopped when you had a picture that said, hey, isn't this really cool? If you combine this and this and this and this in the following way, you can predict the incidence of part failure in elevator motors. Very useful if you're in the elevator business. But it's even more useful if you can take that prediction and put it inside of the supply chain application that says order some more motors. And that's the, the, the greatest and biggest challenge of all is how do we take the data learn from the data, and then turn the data into action. So that's what that team's got to do. The problem with that team is their skills vary all over the map. Data engineers know ETL, and, and you, know, you guys in the, in the SQL Server world are hardcore on data management with uh, Transact SQL. The data scientists typically use four or five tools. So I, 
you know, I've got R on that uh, that arrow in the left, but it's typically R and, and four or five other tools for any useful data scientist. And of course, our business analysts and app developers they use BI tools and reporting tools and uh, and uh, you know web tools for developing websites, etc. And so these folks don't speak the same language. So that's kind of the big challenge that results in this, and that is that. Even if we can build prediction, prediction uh, applications, what is the life cycle we have to go through to get them deployed? So what we're doing with SQL Server is we're attempting to chop off those last three orange circles and shorten this modeling life cycle by providing a platform that allows the data scientists, the data engineers, and the data platform guys to all work together. What we did at Revolution was we first tackled the problem uh, of scale. Since R was dependent upon physical memory, um, and it tended to require all data to be brought into memory before any kind of prediction could be made, any, any predictive model could be developed, we tackled that problem first. And we built algorithms that actually run in parallel. And they only bring in a chunk of data at a time. So it's possible in open source R, if you have an 8 gig laptop, you can generally ingest about 4 gig of data before you're going to hit the wall. And you're going to get an error. It won't, simply won't run beyond that. But with these parallelized algorithms, I can point a, a, you know, an 8 gig laptop at a 500 gig file. And as long as I'm patient, it'll chunk through that file, chunk by chunk by chunk, and produce the computed results that I want and give me my trained models. It may take a while. So that's kind of where we started. And then we started taking that parallelism to other platforms. And uh, since our uh, Microsoft, our primary target has been to introduce that scale and capability the ability to not only act on data far bigger than memory, but also act on that data using every thread and every core of every CPU we can get our little paws on. And we've created with that SQL Server 2016 R services. It'll go generally available later in June. Uh, it is in uh, RC3, or Release Candidate 3 right now, and doing very well. I'm actually going to use that, that version of it for my demo in a bit. So what it gives you is three things. It's a pretty simple product to use, and I think you'll provides a very straightforward, well-understood way for an R user to use it, to build a model, to build a script, and deploy that, uh, that model script as a, as a tool. It provides a fairly easy interface if you want to embed bits of R in your SQL. But I think probably the most exciting bit is it provides a very easy way to turn a piece of, uh, a, a, of R, an R model, a score, uh, a prediction, into a stored procedure and make it very directly callable by other bits of, of the SQL application stack you're running. And I'll show you an app uh, that, that, that you know, does that in like four lines of code. Um, it gives you scalability and choice. And the reason this is important is uh, just like we do on the other platforms, SQL Server, our services, larger than what's available in the way of memory on the server it's running on. So I could easily uh, normalize up a nice big fat fact table of, uh, of a terabyte of data and run that on a server that's got a quarter of a terabyte of RAM. And open source R cannot do that. And then finally, we have made this essentially free. The SQL Server R services is free with full scalability in the Enterprise Edition. The identical programming surface, verbs, APIs, is in the Standard Edition as well with restrictions only on how it parallelizes. So it runs, I think, on two threads instead of whatever's available. So we think we've got the best combination for giving you the ability to learn and use R, but more importantly, present your current footprint of SQL Server infrastructure to your data scientists as an alternative to the way they tend to work today, which is lots and lots of files. And as you know, when people are doing work on lots and lots of files, they tend to have lots and lots of copies that never get deleted, and infrastructure costs shoot up, and data certainty and governance goes down. So it's a very interesting option for your users. The big advantage is we can not only build models using R on laptops, but one of the capabilities of the Microsoft R server systems is something we call remote execution. That means that I can sit at my desktop running Visual Studio, write a script, and if I use the remote executable commands in that script, I can set a flag called a compute context and say, don't do this here. Take too long to move the data over to my server or to my, left, to my desktop. Just push the work over to the SQL Server and run it using our services in the SQL Server. This is all embeddable in T-SQL so that both the R users and the SQL users can use it, because typically those skill sets don't run in the same people. 
it uses 100% R compatible. We are based on and use the open source R interpreter so we don't break compatibility with the 7,000 or so packages. And the result is people can combine data science skills and data management skills in one platform. Performance is hugely different. I'm going to breeze through the rest of these slides. You may have seen this one. This is the same computation on the same laptop done with an open source generalized linear model regression. It's a, a, a logistic uh, uh, regression classification. Um, and the Revo Scale R version, which is the Microsoft R server parallelized version, as you can see, it runs way, way faster and it doesn't run out of memory at 300,000 events like the open source version does. This is an example from an EDW where the prior method was to pull the data out of the EDW, run it on a big server, and push the scores back. Scoring is a scoring customer uh, proclivity. When they pushed the work inside this, the, the engine, the time went up by a fact, or the time went down by a factor of about 50x. So from 300 minutes down to uh, something on the order of uh, three quarters of a minute. I'm sorry, that was about 500x performance improvement. So this is what happens when data gets big, the cost of hauling data out of databases gets very high compared to the cost of analyzing it. So if we push the work to the database engine, we see these kinds of drops in, in time required. I'm not going to belabor this. These slides will be available for you later. But what really happens in SQL Server R services is we can both do work locally, kind of the traditional model of let's pull the data into my workstation. And maybe I work on a small sample of data and look for some correlations and, and, and kind of get an idea of what's in the data, how dirty is the data, uh, is the data complete. And then when I really want to go build models on 10, 20, or 30 percent of uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 gigabytes or even 300 or 400 or 500 gigabytes of data, I can actually tell the system, just kidding, don't want to work locally now, set the compute context to SQL Server, and it will flip uh, the work through SQL Server to an R interpreter that's now part of SQL Server, Server and use parallel algorithms that ship with that SQL Server, excuse me, ship with that uh, R Server uh, to conduct those computations on however many threads and cores the underlying engine has available. So skipping past, um, the second thing that I want to show you today that I think you'll find interesting is our tools for Visual Studio. The data science world is kind of split somewhere around 50-50 or 60-40 between the use of Windows and the use of Linux uh, as a desktop. We think, of course, that uh, more people would like to use Windows, but the number of choices for IDEs uh, that are R-specific and, and, uh, and tooled up to support the R programmer aren't very many. We had a, an old IDE when we were at Revolution, and we, we leveraged from that to a new capability. It's free. It's uh, open source and freely downloadable for Visual Studio 2015.1, and it is called the R Tools for Visual Studio. Drops into the menu, adds some extra choices, but most importantly, and I'll show you this, by clicking one menu choice, it will essentially mimic the dominant IDE in the data science world so those users can immediately become productive in Visual Studio for their R programming work. It's available on the web. Uh, this page, this link is here. I would urge you to go take a look and download it if you're already a Visual Studio user. I'll just note that you need to update to uh, Visual Studio 15, and I believe it's 15.1. But once you're there, if you go to the string and that ends in RTVS, dash VS, you will be able to download and install our tools for Visual Studio. It gives you an editor that has what we know as IntelliSense and Visual Studio, but adapted to the R language syntax. It actually has both a coding window and an interactive window, and I'll show you that uh, if you're familiar with some of the very old simple basic programs, uh, the interactive window in R works kind of the same way. You just type in one-line commands and get answers immediately. Both have IntelliSense. Um, the, um, there's a debugger, which we won't get into too much today, but it is a step-by-step step step breakpoint-oriented debugger for R, which is uh, very helpful and, of course, uh, includes uh, variable inspection so you can watch variables change during execution, et cetera. It has direct inclusion of plotting. As you can bet, you know, when you're doing predictive analytics, you're doing a lot of data introspection and study and gee, let's look at the histogram of this and let's look at a plot of that. And you don't have to go outside of Visual Studio to see those plots. They actually pop up right in a pane in the uh, R tools for Visual Studio. 
And most importantly, there's absolutely nothing that prevents our tools from Visual Studio from working with any edition of open source R or anything based on open source R. Heaven forbid I say it, but if you are just loving Oracle's implementation of R in Exadata, you can use Visual Studio tools for R Studio to do that because that platform, like ours, is based upon the open source versions of R and Visual Studio is designed for that. So let's do some demos and then I'll uh, make a few summary comments about what this is probably going to do to impact you. So we're going to flip over now to Visual Studio. Um, the first thing I want to show you is that our tools, when it installs, produces this additional menu in Visual Studio. And we're getting our screens updated out there now. Almost everybody's up to date. Three, two, one percent left. I'll hold just a second here while everybody gets a fresh screen. I think we're about done. Okay, and what it adds are the capabilities to build our applications by editing our scripts look at plotting and scroll through a list of plots that have been produced in this script. You can actually write a script that produces 10 or 20 plots. Go get a cup of coffee, because sometimes these take a while to produce. It'll produce all 20 plots, and you can come back and scroll through the plots. Um, you can then open any of a number of windows, and the most important is the R interactive window, which is actually talking directly to the R interpreter. Um, and then uh, from there, you can enter commands, you can introspect variables. Uh, all our documentation is available, um, and there's also pointers off to the Microsoft products. Now, one of the key things you want to do after you install our tools in Visual Studio is probably this. How, if you're using Visual Studio and you've made a bunch of settings you like, uh, go to the Tools menu and export your settings. The reason you want to do that is when you set it up for R, it's going to change your window layout and your keyboard shortcuts to make it very useful for data science, and that may make it a little harder to use for other things. So to flip back and forth, export your settings, and, uh, and then run this command, R tools, data science settings. When I do the R tools, data science settings, I get a little warning saying, I'm going to lay out your windows differently. You really want me to do that. What it's doing is it's going to set the windows up to mimic the most popular IDE in the, uh, in the R world. It happens to be a Linux IDE. It's very similar. So we'll go ahead and do that and lay our windows out a little differently. It also asks me, um, do you want the keyboard shortcut that you may have learned in past years using our studio, which is the Linux IDE. It's an open source. So we'll say yes to that, and, and, and we're done. Now I, already, I was already set up for R, uh, but if I was set up for something else, it would change the windows at this point. So that's the first thing I'll show you. The second thing is I want to explain a demo that we're going to show you as an example. I'm going to walk through a lot of the code of it. Um, let me uh, find it where I had it here. I thought I had a copy of it. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. So let's say that I've got a simple problem like this. And the problem I'm going to show you is uh, one you may have seen in a past, um, uh, past summit. I believe it was out in, uh, um, uh, in the October time frame. But we built an example of um, uh, a taxi timer that used a data set that was produced by New York City government. And that data set uh, was, I don't know, a, a very, very large number of rows. I know it was over a billion um, of taxi rides and Uber rides over a long period of time. Um, and it included you know, who was the cab, who was the Uber, uh, where were they picked up, where were they dropped off, and then three other indications. What was the, dis uh, what was the fare? Was a tip received? And uh, let's see, it was one other. So it's, it was, it was. Uh, I'm, I'm having a brain, uh, brain, uh, brain break here. But the, the three predictions were: what was the, the the measured data and the predictions we want to make, or what was the fare, what was the tip, and what was the travel time. And the reason the travel time was interesting is you want to go to an airport. So let's say in our example application, what we want to do is pick an origin, the place we're starting, and we want to go to one of the New York airports. And let's choose JFK. You can see that's a pretty long slog across there that varies greatly uh, depending on the traffic. But I want to use a predictive model that I've built using the millions of records of past taxi rides to give us a rough idea of how long it's going to take me to get to JFK and what it's going to cost. And so what we have here is a simple application, but it's actually using predictive analytics as part of the application. And this is, again, that model where we're taking traditional application development 
and adding in predictive analytics to make the application smarter. So think about that as our, exa as our example, and I'm going to actually show you the code that we use to build that. So first, let's talk about the database. And um, uh, the first thing we want to know is how big is the database. We have a modest sample. This is actually running in Azure, and I'll just let you know it's running on an A2 machine, very small. Um, I should probably set it up on a bigger machine. But you can see uh, I've got about uh, 1.7 million uh, rows of the the hundreds of millions of rows in that data set loaded up. So we have a, you know, it's a modestly decent sized database and we use that for modeling and development. What we need to do in any of these cases is first get the data loaded and as you can see I've got it loaded. Then we need to modify the data, perhaps uh, coercing certain data variables into other formats, um, bucketing data, uh, computing synthetic values like if I've got uh, uh, in the particular database here, we have latitude and longitude for both the origin and the destination of the trip. Well, that's not exactly good data for prediction of taxi time. Better data is how many miles did we travel? And so one of the typical transformations in something like this might be to convert the units or the type of data from what you have. And then we would call that feature engineering. That's the common term. So let's, um, let's show you a couple of things real quick. I'm going to go first to the traditional R GUI so you can see the difference. This is the GUI that ships with R, and this is called the R console. What it does is simply gives me a console into which I can type code or paste code and run code. Things like, you know, X gets uh, 3. What's X? X is 3. And Y gets 7. Oops, can't type today. And what's y? Well, y is 7. Well, OK, so let's make z equal to you know, x plus y. And, 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 and so let's look at z, and z is 10. So it, it's a very simplistic interface in some ways. And so it gives you some idea of the fairly limited tools that are, were available to our programmers over the years. Well, that's why these IDEs became important. And so from that starting point, we've evolved to this point, where we have a rich IDE that gives us the ability to look at code, to actually, you'll notice that the same functions that I had in the simple IDE are here. So we we'll have a variable called S7, and you know we can put variables into that and make it equal to 23. You know, whatever we want to do. Um, a little slow there for some reason. That's kind of weird. Um, and over here, I actually have a variable explorer that shows the variables that I have currently added. And there's the S7 I just added, for example. Uh, and these are the other variables in my script. But now let's look at the script for a moment. If we think about what has to happen, I need to basically do the three steps I showed you earlier. I need to load and feature engineer data to get it into formats that I can use for modeling. I need to then understand the correlations in that data, which variables in the data set are likely to be good predictors of the outcomes we're looking for, like how long is it going to take me to get to the airport and am I going to make my flight? And finally, I need a way to take that model that I've created and operationalize it so it's easily accessible to the guy who wrote the web app that I just showed you. So we're going to do those three steps. First step is essentially done, as I said, the data is in the database. In R, we need to utilize, oftentimes, packages that come from the outside world. And one of those, for example, is RODBC. And this is a package that is open source for R. It's shared by many, many, many users. And it allows R to utilize ODBC as a data source. Good example. So what we have to do is load those. And I just did that. Um, I did need to perhaps load some packages that will allow me to look at graphs. One of the most popular here is ggplot. And I'll, you'll see some, some uh, graphs done with ggplot. And finally, at the bottom here, you'll see library Rebo Scale R. Revo Scale R is the name of the library that contains those very high performance parallelized algorithms that we produced at Revolution that become the backbone of extending R to handle big data. Revo Scale R algorithms get loaded both in the client and they're already loaded in the SQL Server so that when I load them here, I can use them locally. And then when I'm ready to run something that's big, I can point it at a much larger data set and run the very same script inside a SQL Server to, say, do a histogram of 1.7 million lines in the file. So let's run those. And we have just loaded all those data, uh, all those uh, packages into my application. 
Now we want to start talking to our data. So the first thing, of course, we have to do is say, you know, where, and in this particular case, where in Azure is my database, and give it a, give the script a connection string that identifies uh, the URL of the machine and uh, the database that I'm going to uh, I'm going to access. So we'll go ahead and run that. Before I do, let me show you the rest of the script. These six lines set up what we call the remote execution context. They basically are the pointer to SQL Server. So that when I run one of these massively parallel algorithms on my workstation, instead of running locally, it packs up the parameter list, ships it via an attachment to an ODBC request over to the SQL Server database, which then unpacks the request and runs the R script, or the R um, algorithm, in the machine that's hosting SQL Server. And so it's simply a switch. If I say Rx set compute context parenthesis local, it'll make all my subsequent parallel algorithms run on my workstation and I'll have to move my data there. If I do this script, I'll set up the connection string and the location in which I want to move data in and out of the database um, and, and run all those commands remotely. So here we go. And that ran very quickly. We are now set so that any subsequent parallelized algorithms we run from the scale R library will actually not run locally, they will push over to SQL Server, in this case up into Azure. So I mentioned that the tail end of the first step is feature engineering, it's figuring out what data we want to use. We've kind of already done that here, so I'll show you that first we're going to specify a query. This is our query. We're specifying a SQL string, as you obviously have noted already, and then we are using that SQL string in one of our remote parallel commands called Rx SQL Server data, and that basically is a take the query, get the data, make the data accessible to the R engine that's running in SQL Server so that we can do some work on it. Now I have two sets of that. One is a feature set that predicts the, the uh, trip this, the trip time, and another that uh, predicts the tip that the driver received. So let's run all of that. And the last feature that, or the last line here you see is this one, and I'm watching the screen. I realize I'm probably talking ahead of the screen a bit. So my apologies to those of you that are on slow connections. Let's let these screens update. The last line in this chunk of code I'm going to run is called Rx get var info. And what it's going to do is simply tell us what the uh, data signature is of the data that we have made available to R. So let's run that. And that won't take very long. And sure enough, down here in my results window, you can see I ran the code. And then the get var info here, oops, I'm having trouble highlighting. Get var info told us what's in the data set and what type the data is. So we now know what we need to write our scripts to analyze. Okay. With that done, and there are two sets, by the way. There's the first set of 17 columns for the tip and 17 columns uh, that are used a little bit differently uh, for predicting the uh, travel time. All right. So once we have done that and we have our data loaded into a shared area that's accessible to the R interpreter in the SQL engine, we can do things like run histograms on the data. Now I'm going to run two histograms. They're going to show up over here in my plot window. You'll see there's nothing there now. So uh, like the magician who shows you that the hat is empty before he pulls the white dove out of it. I'm going to run these. Now these are running histograms. This, uh, these commands get pushed to SQL Server and they run across the entire 1.7 million um, uh, uh, row data set. And it does it twice because I'm doing two different histograms. So let me run those. That'll take a couple of seconds to run, more than a couple actually, about 30 seconds to run. While it's doing that, I'll show you some other things we're going to do. Um, we're going to import a little bit of feature data and create some functions here that we'll use later when we start analyzing the data. That'll show up next. You won't see much from that. And then we're going to run something called a correlation matrix. So let's get down here. You can see um, the uh, uh, interactive R window is still spinning. And as it spins, it is computing the two histograms. And I want to let that complete before we go on. So um, 
this ran very swiftly at about 3 a.m. this morning. I wonder why in the middle of the morning it's running a little slower. Joys of the cloud, I guess, is how we'd put that. Uh, so uh, as this works, um, let me tell you what a correlation matrix is going to tell us and, and why it's important. This is a simple warning we get from our ODBC. We haven't figured out uh, the little bug in CTP3 that they're working on. But uh, up here in the correlation matrix area, a correlation matrix just tells us which of the input variables are correlated with other input variables. And why do you want to know that? Well, it's very simple. If two variables are highly correlated and they both have an effect on the output, you don't need to use them both in the predictive equation. In other words, if being shot and, and, and getting cancer both affect my lifespan, um, they're probably not highly correlated because they're different events. But if, 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 if getting shot and bleeding out from getting shot are both in the data set, they're probably highly correlated. And so I don't need to use both of those. And sorry for the gross example. I don't know why that came to mind. Um, too many shoot 'em up movies on Saturday night, I guess. But if we, uh, if we use the correlation matrix, what we can identify is where there are variables that we do not need to use in the modeling equation because their effect is actually produced by another, um, by another variable. And we are finished running here, although I think that error killed our plot. I'm a little unhappy about this because this ran an hour ago. Um, let's have some fun. Let's try it again. I may have not gotten all the input data done. So let's, uh, let's run just one of these again. Let's do the, the uh, taxi fare prediction again, or uh, histogram, and see what that's going to give us. And it doesn't like that ODBC handle, but it is running. So let's let that run a minute and see if we can get a histogram so I can show you where the plots are going to show up um, in our, in our uh, plot window. And we'll get ready for the next step here by highlighting the next chunk of code that I'm going to want to run. And there is that. So let's see if this is going to, it looks like it ran, but it did not succeed. I'm disappointed. I'll have to go figure that out. Continuing on, uh, bravely forward in the face of a bug. At this point, now that we have uh, uh, some idea of what's in our data set, we can begin trying to make predictions from that data. What we do here is we run, uh, we want to build linear models, and I just ran the code that does that. And what you see coming up in my results window Give it a couple of seconds to refresh here. You'll notice that we're seeing something here like uh, I made a call to something called LinMod. That's a linear regression modeling algorithm that then produces some idea of how it ran, how many passes it made over the data, how many variables it actually ran on. And then it gives us actually the coefficients of the equation that allows us to predict the desired result. In this case, it is uh, the trip time. Okay, And these are very standard bits of uh, statistical information that statisticians and data scientists work with to determine, has this algorithm run well? Once we have built those models, and we did, we built three of them, I think. So you can see there's one model that predicts tip, another model that predicts fare, and a third model that predicts travel time. How do we then make those usable in SQL Server? We're kind of to the point now where we've done the predictive modeling bit. Now we have to do scoring. So the way we do that, if I want to just predict the data for all of the rows I already have, I can run this algorithm called Rx Predict, and that's a remote executing parallel prediction algorithm. And what it does is it tells SQL Server, grab every row in that database, or in the incoming select statement, grab every row run those coefficients that define the predicting equation and deposit the predicted fare, tip, and travel time into columns in the database. I'm not going to do that here because that takes a little while. It's not actually very, very slow. It actually runs pretty fast. But the interesting thing is once I've done that and I can you know, graph and model and look and see how accurate my prediction is, the question is what do I need to do to then take those models and make them part of the database so they're accessible to the rest of my data science team who are building applications and producing things that users actually use. What we do is we take the actual model, which is 
up here when I create a model, the model gets created as an object, it's an R object, and it can be serialized, and here I'm doing that, let's say the tip linear regression object, which is the model, the, the predictive equation, is just a text string, and I can serialize that and then store that in the database. What I do in this particular case is I have three tables to hold the models. The tables never have more than one row in them because they I only post into that table one row at a time. But by putting them in a table in the database, I can use SQL to pull a model out, embed an R script in a stored procedure, and run that stored procedure each time my user clicks on the application that says, show me how long it's going to take me to get to JFK. So we've built models now. We have serialized the models, and, and we will soon here deposit them with a SQL query into tables uh, that contain the uh, persistent, uh, the, the, uh, that persist the models for availability start procedures. Okay. Now there's some testing code here that I'm not going to show you. What I'm going to show you next is uh, the stored procedures that actually use the models in response to the web app I showed you earlier uh, predicting the uh, taxi time travel time. So I create a stored procedure. I give it the variables that I know are going to go in and out. I tell it to select the top row, the only row in the model table. And remember I said I have a, a table that holds the predictive model uh, for the particular event, whether it's the fare or the, uh, or the travel time. I'll select out that one row. It's a, it's a serialized text object. I'll deserialize that in, inside of some R script. So what you see here that's different now is that this line of code embeds a small R script in the stored procedure. I have pulled out my model object above it, handed it to that script. That script unserializes the model into a variable called mod, an R object, and then uses that model object inside of the Rx predict operator to produce an output set from our input data. So very simply, in about 15 lines of code, 20 lines of code maybe, we are extracting the model from the table we put it in, pulling the parameters in from the stored procedure into an R script, running a prediction operator called RxPredict, and depositing the results where it can be returned to the application. So you can see, if I showed you all of it, there will be three of these stored procedures put into the database. The neat thing is, their calling signature looks just like any other stored procedure. They just happen to have a little bit of R code in them. And that little bit of R code is the R code that applies that predictive model to the inbound variables, uh, the input data set uh, to the stored procedure. And so when we're done, what we get is the result I showed you before, that uh, I'm able to um, Where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? I'm slow in this. Okay, here we go. I'm a no, that's not what I wanted to show you. Uh, let's try again. We had a little trouble getting screen resolutions. I'm able to show you the results and populate them on the screen in my web app uh, uh, from the predictions I made in SQL Server. I hope that wasn't too unclear. The last thing I want to show you is just some summary stuff in the presentation. Uh, to talk about the practicality of doing this. So one of the questions that I get routinely from anybody in the SQL Server world is, well, what does this mean uh, in terms of my personal workload uh, as a DBA or a data engineering guy? And it really means the following things. When you install SQL Server 2016, you have an option to install the SQL Server R services. When you click to install SQL Server R services, it separately invokes installers for the Microsoft R open. That's the R interpreter, which has to be present. It installs some uh, base and recommended application packages, uh, linear regressions and things like that, uh, that are in open source, also get installed. And then it installs Microsoft R services, which contains things like uh, uh, data input adapters, uh, and uh, most importantly, the ScaleR parallel algorithms that you see here on the right. So that install is very straightforward. Uh, it, it, it looks kind of complicated, but once you start it, it runs to, to uh, completion almost with no intervention at all. 
The second piece of your workload, or the first piece extent, uh, continued, is to enable external scripts. Remember I showed you that you could actually invoke a bit of R from within a SQL script? Well, there's a flag that allows you to turn that on and off. So you need to turn that on. And I believe you can also uh, do that on a, on a uh, uh, fairly selective and granular basis. Uh, but what that allows you to do is, is uh, not have the risk of some unknown R script running unless you are wanting that to happen as a DBA. For your users that are going to be a blend of SQL and, uh, and R users, uh, installing Visual Studio and then installing R tools for Visual Studio for the R users is uh, perhaps something you wouldn't get involved in as a DBA, but you might have to advise on this. You will need to grant permissions uh, to, uh, to allow uh, the reader and writer, which is the, these are the engines that essentially allow data from SQL Server to be read into R on the server. And then finally, of course, uh, the users will want to have Microsoft R open uh, on their workstations. And I'll just give you a, a quick preview. We're changing the naming of some of that. So there will be something called the Microsoft R client uh, coming out. It's really not much different than what we have, but it, it gives a bit more freedom and, and a clearer naming to uh, what gets put on the workstations. And then there are all kinds of samples you can install as well. So that basically sets everybody up. And now the fun stuff starts. The question you need to look at if you're going to be supporting a bunch of R users is how much modeling they're going to do. You saw in my application a fairly straightforward example using a 1.7 million row sample table. Most of the modeling activities and the histogramming and all that uh, linearly consumes that entire table. Now we're pretty good at doing that fast, um, but those of you with a long history of optimizing SQL queries will look at that and wrinkle your nose and say, gee, that looks an awful lot like a table scan. And so you need to be anticipating that some of the workload you're going to see when you have our users working on a SQL Server is going to look somewhat spiky. When they're doing basic development on their laptops, you're not going to see that much unless they're making the mistake of pulling massive data to their laptop. Where you're going to see the spikes is when they start using the remote execution commands, and you can turn them on and off. Uh, but when you turn them on and someone starts doing um, uh, uh, a complicated algorithm like a, a k-means clustering uh, or a random forest on uh, you know a, a, a hundred million or billion row fact table, you're going to see that in your logs. You're going to see that a big drag on the SQL Server. So you'll need to develop some experience. Uh, you know the stuff is visible in the tools. Uh, in the administration tools for SQL Server, and it's visible in the administration tools for uh, the underlying Windows Server. And so um, be watching for spiky workloads, and you'll get a handle pretty quickly on, uh, on how much you need to worry about that. If you've only got one or two data science users, and they're using you know, uh, 50,000 to a million row files, you're not going to see much. But when they get into the 100 millions in most, you're going to notice that in your, in your workloads. And finally, one of the more uh, questionable areas where you're going to need to think about and work with your security administrator is that R is an extensible language. It's extensible by downloading things from the internet. And the minute you say download an internet in the same sentence, you can imagine what your security guy is going to say. How do you know that that's not carrying some, some bad code? And so it'll be up to you to decide, um, work with your data science team to make sure that the, the algorithms that you actually pull into uh, your SQL Server are coming from sources that you trust, um, and, uh, and you can be reasonably assured that you're not bringing in some malicious code. The way you do that is very simple. Uh, typically, you use the R GUI on the SQL Server engine itself and you specify the libraries one time and tell it to install the packages from whichever repository you're pulling them from. You will almost always pull them from CRAN or something called MRAN, and the M is Microsoft. We actually... Hey, uh, uh, Bill, I think we are almost uh, right up the time. We are so. right on time. Okay, very good. I'm, I'm finished here. So that's the workload stuff, and I, it's funny you brought that up right as my question slide came up. So we've come awesome. to the end. Uh, do you have any particular questions you want to bring forward? Yeah, so uh, people are asking a few questions. Uh, is the sample code uh, in the session is going to be available somewhere after? Uh, yes, it will. We haven't exactly figured out. There, we're building a lab, a hands-on lab, that is exactly this example. And okay. uh, there is a demonstration available to Microsoft staffers right now as well. We'll also make available uh, the same thing through um, the partner enablement uh, 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 lab distributions as well.
Okay. And another question, interesting question is, does our service eventually replace the data mining tools and the likes that are run in SSAS cubes? I, I don't think so. And I think they wind up being complementary because the R users are not typically the type of people who are going to sit around and do um, you know, uh, the type of analysis you do in SSAS. They're really kind of different use cases. One is producing uh, essentially rapid turnaround uh, uh, aggregative models that show you what happened or what's in the data. The, the R guys are going to be doing predictive models. So it's really a different and complementary activity. Okay. And another question people are asking is, can uh, Bill recommend a good book to get an understanding of analytics in R? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, one of our product managers wrote uh, uh, R for Dummies. Uh, his name is Andre DeVries, a very good starting point book. There are a number of very good R courses available on Coursera and some of the other online uh, training repositories. I generally send people to Coursera. There's a Johns Hopkins course and a University of Washington course that are both very good. All right, and uh, uh, I think we are almost right out of time and uh, we will answer the other questions in a blog post somewhere. And uh, so, next slide. Let's go to the Oops, I'm going to have a little trouble with the slide handler. There we go. Okay. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I got it. I, I see it. After the questions, was this next yeah, call? Ma so make sure there is a next session that's uh, uh, five techniques to beautiful data insights with R and SSRs with uh, Thomas Kastron and Julie Kosmano. And um, that's all the time we have right now. And thank you for all, uh, you know, for attending this session. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you.